Good afternoon, and welcome to our fourth NHLBI Small Biz Hangout, Biologic Drug Development Pre-IND to Approval. My name is Chris Sassiella, and I'm a regulatory specialist in the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute in the Office of Translational Alliances and Coordination. I will be moderating today's Hangout. In my role at NHLBI, I work with investigators in the cardiovascular, pulmonary, hematologic, and sleep disorder disciplines to help them understand the regulatory framework and processes that surround their biomedical innovations and technology development within the U.S. My office has developed the Small Biz Hangout series as an interactive way to provide this information. Today's Hangout will focus on describing FDA's regulation of biologic therapies and how small businesses and independent investigators can develop a compliant and cohesive regulatory strategy and development plan from preclinical testing through post-approval reporting. We will pause at the end of each section of the presentation to answer your questions. And we ask that you please pose questions that relate to the content of the presentation rather than to your specific technology as we would likely need much more information about your innovation than you should provide in a public forum in order to answer technology-specific questions. You can post your questions to my office's Twitter handle, which is at NHLBI underscore SBIR, or by tweeting using the hashtag SBIRChat, all one word. If you're watching this video as an archived event and have questions about its content, please reach out to either myself or today's presenter. Today, I am very excited to welcome Marsha Guido to our Small Biz Hangout. Marsha has over 20 years of experience shepherding innovative biologic therapies, including blood isolates, cell therapies, therapeutic proteins, and monoclonal antibodies, from the pre-IND stage to approval and beyond. Marsha began her regulatory career by developing a strong foundation in chemistry, manufacturing, and controls aspects of regulation while working at Diosynth on the approval packages for Redivase and Pegvisamat. Since leaving Diosynth, she's focused on supporting the clinical and preclinical development of therapeutics in the areas of oncology, addiction, and plasma-derived replacement products while working with companies such as Eremos Pharmaceutical, Argos Therapeutics, Metamune, and Prometic Biotherapeutics. She has extensive experience preparing and maintaining INDs and has obtained orphan and fast-track designations for several development programs. Marsha has served as a liaison for multiple FDA milestone meetings, including pre-IND, end of phase two, and pre-BLA meetings, as well as during peri-approval negotiations relating to labeling, quality questions, and post-approval commitments. Additionally, she has hosted five pre-approval inspections. Marsha earned a BS in biochemistry from the University of Notre Dame a PhD in pharmacology and toxicology from West Virginia University, and her regulatory affairs certification from the Regulatory Affairs Professional Society. We are truly fortunate to have Marsha's experience available to us today, and I'd like to say thank you and welcome to Marsha. We're looking forward to the presentation. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Chris pointed out, our topic today is uh, biologics drug development. We're going to talk about regulatory affairs um, topics from pre-IND through to approval. Uh, specifically, today we're going to talk about what is a biologic, who would FDA reviews the biologics applications, what do you need to do to, to get an IND, and what do you need to do to keep the IND updated during development, and then um, we'll talk about the special FDA programs to think about whether your, your biologic qualifies for. And then um, we'll finish up with talking about what goes into the BLA and what do you need to do once your biologic is approved. So first, what is a biologic? And very simply, biologics are drugs that are made from living things. So these could be proteins, cells, viruses, vaccines, blood products, allergenics, but the key is that um, these products need to be um, being studied for the prevention or treatment um, or cure of a disease. So who at FDA actually reviews biologics? So there, um, biologics actually go to both centers of FDA. Uh, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research does the majority of the um, biologics review, and they cover the more complex biologics like gene therapy, vaccines, and blood products. But the Center for Drug Evaluation Research also has a whole um, class of biologics, and these are called the well-characterized proteins. 
And um, these proteins also um, cover the biosimilars. And a uh, you know, majority of those uh, recent approvals have been monoclonal antibodies. But the review of these um, proteins at, at the Center for Drugs is actually disseminated throughout CEDAR. So there's no one centralized office. It, you, um, if you're developing a protein, you send your package to whichever clinical um, division is responsible. So oncology, for instance, or cardiovascular or renal, for example. Whereas at CBER, um, they review all applications based on product type, and that's shown in more detail here. So there's three main offices of CBER. One, the first is the Office of Blood Research and Review, and they review anything to do with plasma, blood uh, transfusions, um, proteins purified from plasma. They also um, cover devices and thing, anything that's used for blood collection and for testing of blood, which is unique for um, for the the Center for, um, unique for CBER and CBER as well. Um, typically, devices all go to the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. So, but everything to do with blood testing and manufacturing uh, goes to Office of Blood Research and Review. The Office of Vaccines Research and Review um, covers the vaccines for infectious diseases that you're all that everyone is familiar with, as well as allergen patch tests and allergenics. And then the, th the third office um, is the Office of Cellular Tissue and Gene Therapies. And this covers any tissues for transplantation. Um, which this does not include any um, organ donation, though. Um, they also review cellular products and all gene therapy products. So there is one key difference between biologics and drugs. Um, biologics are approved under a, the biologics license application because the approval, the authority for approving um, biologic comes from the authority for approving a new drug under the NDA comes from the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. But other than that, there are a lot of similarities between um, the regulations that apply to drugs and biologics. Um, for instance, the GMPs, GCPs, and GLPs are all the same for drugs and biologics. Um, there's numerous FDA guidance documents that um, apply to both um, centers. And then the International Conference of Harmonization, Quality, Safety, and Efficacy Guidelines, a lot of those documents apply to both um, biologics and drugs as well as the IND regulations and the um, NDA BLA regulations. Um, I'll move on to the next topic if there aren't any questions. Um, what I wanted to talk about next was what do you need to do to get an IND for that great new product that you have? Um, if, you, if you are um, developing a new drug and a new indication, that's when you need to file the IND with the um, appropriate Center, Steeper or Cedar, the majority of INDs are sponsor INDs. So those are the ones that the company submits to be able to develop their new therapy. There's also investigator IND, emergency use IND, and treatment IND, which are used in these specific um, instances that are provided here. Okay, so what actually goes into the IND? And there's three basic questions that you need to answer when you're preparing your information for the IND. One is can we expect your product to be safe in humans? And you do that by preparing um, testing and reports from your animal pharmacology and toxicology studies. Next, you have to provide how do you make your product, and that's your manufacturing information. And, and lastly, um, you need to provide a clinical protocol and, and explain what you're going to do with that product, the product, how you're going to test it in humans, and how you're going to assess its safety in humans. As well, you need to provide um, details about the specific investigators that that are going to run the trial for you. This slide shows the 10 required elements for the IND. Um, the administrative sections are one and two. Um, item three, you need to provide your general investigational plan, which um, outlines what you plan to do for the upcoming year in the clinic. Item five is the investigator's brochure that you will provide to all investigators during the trial. Six is the um, protocol that you're requesting approval of in the IND. Seven is where you put your chemistry, manufacturing, and controls information. Item eight is pharmacology and toxicology. And then item nine is previous human experience. And if it's a brand new product, you may not have previous human experience. But you may know of related products, or you might have other development programs that are similar. And you may want to draw on some of that knowledge to predict the safety of your product. And you could describe that in item nine as well. The next question you'll have to figure out is whether you want to be paper or electronic. So electronic format is allowed for the IND, but it's required by the time of the BLA um, or NDA. 
There's a lot of advantages to the electronic format. It's easier for publishing. The hyperlinking allows the, a much easier review process for the FDA. Um, it also makes IND amendments easier to submit and track. Um, and any final study reports that have been submitted don't have to be resubmitted at the time of the licensing application, which is nice. You can just point back to the previous submission. The other advantage to electronic is they, um, those files are much more transport. The IND is much more transportable for due diligence activities and partnering activities. So if you are going to go, um, in, in any case, you would probably want to consider following the common technical document for your IND. And this is a common structure that's been developed by the International Conference for Harmonization, which is made up of US, Europe, and Japan. And this next slide shows the structure of the CTD, common technical document. So module one um, is where all your administrative information goes, so that's the country-specific information, as well as the um, package inserts, the actual prescribing information for your new drug. Uh, module two covers all the major um, overviews, so you have one for manufacturing, non-clinical and clinical. And then module three is where you put the more specific um, CMC information and data. Module four is where you put all your non-clinical study reports. And module five is where you put your clinical study reports. And during the IND stage, module five is where you put the protocol and the investigator data. This slide shows the 10 required elements for the IND and shows you exactly where they map in the CTD module. This is just being provided for reference. So next, I wanted to talk about um, kind of some regulatory considerations for biologics where, that are somewhat different from drugs during development. And first is that um, animal testing of biologics is, can be much more difficult and, and limited because when you put human materials into an animal, they're often, often very immunogenic. And so you may only be able to do a short, very short-term dosing. So there um, are there are a lot of ways to get around that, um, but uh, it, it, you must realize that the toxicology requirements for different biologics is very variable. So you may have a very limited tox program for a cell therapy or a plasma product, um, but then you might have a very complex long-term nine-month repeat dose tox study for therapeutic proteins. So it really is a case-by-case -case basis. Another thing that can happen um, because you have to have such short-term tox for, for some biologics, you, if you have a novel excipient or a reagent or some type of leachate, you could actually do your toxicology separately on that material. So your biologic's not actually in there, but you're gem demonstrating the safety of whatever novel material might also be in your product. So because toxicology testing is, um, needs to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis, it really behooves um, the sponsor to go talk to the review division in a pre-pre-IND consultation before you start the tox program so you don't spend a lot of money and um, generate a lot of data that may not um, be covering everything that the FDA is looking for. Next thing are some um, considerations for biologics related to chemistry manufacturing controls. And the first is it's very important to understand that for biologics, the manufacturing process is much more complex. So um, what you will hear people say is that the process is the product because anytime you make little changes, you have the potential to cause a big effect in the product. And you may not have sufficient testing ability to identify those changes. So um, FDA really um, needs these, um, our manufacturing processes to be very tightly controlled and, and a lot of control over the changes that we make so that the biologics are the same from one batch to the next. It's also important to recognize that your controls and your test methods and specifications need to increase in complexity and qualification status throughout the clinical development program. And um, it's important to uh, keep up with this and get started early because if your clinical um, studies go very well, you don't want to be stuck with a two-year delay at the end because your CMC is not ready for commercialization. Another thing that's unique to um, biologics is uh, these additional standards for lot release, and that includes potency. So biologics, you must demonstrate potency for a biologic, and it can be um, an in vitro quick assay, maybe in early stages of development, but as you proceed to um, phase three and pivotal studies, you really need a very uh, sturdy um, potency assay that very clearly predicts the ability of the product to do what you purport that it's going to do when it gets into humans. There's two other tests that you need to, uh, that are unique to biologics, and that's the general safety, which is a quick injection in mice and guinea pigs just to make sure there's no extraneous toxicities. And then um, for purity, you need to demonstrate that there's no pyrogenic substances in your material. 
So for clinical studies, um, the development path is very similar between drugs and biologics. So it's, you know, follows this, the traditional phase one, two, three, four model. But um, biologics clinical development, just like preclinical, is, is also highly variable and needs to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. So the biosimilars and plasma-derived products and, and certain rare disease products, you may only be able to do, may only need to do one pivotal study. So you need to um, talk to the review division and study the precedent for the related molecules that you can find out there and determine what is the reasonable development package for your, for your product. Um, then, of course, the clinical aspect with regard to providing the investigator data and um, registering your trial on clinicaltrials.gov are the same between drugs and biologics. Marsha, we actually did have one question earlier, which was a request for a copy of the slides, and I'd just like to make our audience aware that they can certainly request the slides by reaching out to me at nhlbi underscore sbir at nhlbi.mail.gov, and I'll be happy to provide those via email after the presentation is concluded or at any point in the future. Thanks, Chris. Okay, so the next topic is what do I need to do um, to, to keep my IND developing um, and moving along during development? Um, so after you submit your IND to FDA, they have 30 days to review your IND and let you know if your um, clinical investigation is safe to proceed or if they believe um, that it's necessary to put a clinical hold on that study. During that 30 days, um, FDA will often ask for more information and they may request specific revisions to the clinical protocol. And if you can turn that information around quickly and provide the updates to FDA, um, a lot of times that is sufficient to, um, to prevent the clinical hold. But if um, you know, if the answers are insufficient or too much data is needed, um, the IND may be placed on hold. Um, a hold issue could be something like a talk safety data is not adequate for the dosing schedule. Sometimes um, a correction action, corrective action you can make there would be to uh, change your dosing schedule or lower your dose. Um, other times maybe your CMC data is incomplete. So it's, there's lots of um, issues that could come up during the IND review. But um, my best advice is that you go ahead and use your pre-D meeting with the FDA to de-risk this review process. And by talking to the FDA, um, you know, sit four to six months at least before the IND, longer if, um, you know, if there's going to be a lot of tox toxicology studies, um, you can bring up all these issues and um, talk about your CMC testing and talk about your clinical design, talk about your tox package. Um, and learn um, what FDA's concerns might be so that you can prevent a clinical hold during the IND review process. So um, just to cover the formal meetings you have to be between FDA and sponsors a little bit further, so the pre-IND meeting is a type B meeting or a milestone meeting. The other um, milestone meetings are the end of phase one, end of phase two, and pre-BLA. They're typically granted within 60 days of um, requesting. The type A meeting is one that's used for when your product development is stalled until you can talk to FDA, and they typically grant those quickly within 30 days. And then a type C meeting is for everything else. So to prepare for your meeting with the FDA, um, you would um, want to collect all your information that you have, you might have questions about or that you might want to inform them about. So you would include CMC, preclinical, and clinical information. And when you put the meeting request into FDA, you need to um, be sure that you're including detailed questions because those questions determine who um, the reviewers are going to be that will attend your meeting. Then um, once I grant the meeting, um, and 30 days before the meeting, you'll provide a, a very detailed briefing book to give all the background information that you think FDA would need to be able to answer your question properly. So while you're waiting for the FDA meeting to take place, you prepare the team by thinking about the questions that you've given as well as other things you think the FDA might come back with from their questions and start developing scripted answers and um, pre um, thoughts so that you're ready to articulate um, the diff on different issues that might come up when you're discussing with FDA. Um, the day or two before the meeting, you will actually get the FDA's preliminary responses and that gives you a chance to see where you know, what they really think about some of your questions. And it might go ahead and answer a number of the questions. Um, it might even answer all the questions and you can cancel the meeting. But um, if there are still remaining questions, you would let FDA, FDA know which ones you want to talk about and then you would um, focus on those during the meeting. There's, um, for new companies, there's always a tendency to want to give a pre-planned presentation during the FDA meeting. But um, you need to limit those. Um, they've read your briefing book. Um, 
you know, you need to focus in the meeting on the issues um, rather than, um, you know, spending too much time on trying to present information about your company. So at the end of the meeting, you're going to summarize the decisions and actions to make sure that everybody's in agreement um, with regard to the sponsor and FDA. And then you also provide a, a copy of your minutes to the FDA quickly. And then um, hopefully if there is any um, disagreements between each person's conclude, each group's conclusions for the meeting, that will get worked out. And then FDA's minutes are the official record of the meeting. And if you identify problems with the minutes, you need to get back to FDA and try to get clarification or get the minutes reissued. So there are a lot of um, things that you need to do during the IND stage. You need to keep your file, your IND updated. Um, for instance, anytime there's a new, investigation, new investigator added to your study, you need to um, provide that information. Anytime you revise the protocol or you want to run a new protocol, that gets submitted to the IND. There's also an um, annual update requirement. And that can include any clinical development data, pre new preclinical data, and safety data, as well as CMC. There's also, um, you need to uh, closely, as we talked about for biologics, you need to closely um, monitor changes that need to be made to the manufacturing and make sure that you're talking to FDA in real time about those changes in case there's a potential for impacting um, product safety. And you, uh, you may need to get FDA approval before you use that product in the clinic. The next area um, that's very important to keep up with in the IND is your safety reporting. So um, the MedWatch system is only used for post-approval. So during the IND stage, if you have any um, CSARs, you know, unexpected um, SAEs, those need to be reported directly to your IND. And then another thing to plan for as you're, um, you know, thinking about your submissions and your interactions with FDA is when should those milestone meetings happen, when we have data and um, you know, make sure they're scheduled and planned in advance so that you don't um, delay your development program. So we've talked a lot about how to do the IND. I um, wanted to talk a little bit about what, what, is, what, is, um, what are you really trying to do with your product. And a good tool to do that with is something called the Target Product Profile. And this is organized um, with all the key sections from the drug labeling, so basically um, the package insert. So basically you're beginning with the end in mind. So you, you need to sit and think about what do you want your package insert to look like? What, what, um, what indications do you want? What's the dosage form going to be? Um, <clears throat> and once you lay all that out, and then you work backwards to make sure that the clinical studies you're doing are going to support each of those claims that you want to make. And you can discuss these. You can actually use the target product profile in discussions with FDA as well. So where do you start to um, understand the landscape and understand um, what's expected for your product? There's two uh, great sources of information. One is the CBER website of approved products. Um, the link is provided here. And that's where you can go and see um, package inserts and uh, summary basis of approval and discipline review letters. Um, <clears throat> also, another great source of information are the, um, the clinical trials. Um, registries and the clinicaltrials.gov is a, everybody has to register their efficacy trial there so that's a great source to find out what other molecules that are, that are similar to yours or indications that are similar to yours are being um, done so you can kind of understand anything that might be competing with your product development plans. This is an example of what the licensed uh, products webpage looks like at FDA so you would go in and pick, um, pick one of these approved products and uh, open it up and then you'll get to the screen and you'll, um, you'll see a link to the package insert and to the uh, summary basis of approval. And you can open these and it really gives a lot of detail about what the FDA thought about the um, BLA when it was being reviewed. And um, the discipline review letters provide a lot of detail about what, um, what they were comfortable with and where they maybe had some concerns. That's so a great learning tool for your product development. Um, if there's no questions, we'll move on to the next um, topic, which is... So, um, actually, Marsha, yeah. there, there is one question, and the question is, how do I find out more about creating a target product profile? There's actually a guidance document on target product profile. You can just put in um, on the FDA website and type in target product profile, and the guidance document will pop right up. Great. Thank you. Or, very um, much. or we, if they want to send their email, we can certainly send it to them. Okay. 
Okay, so the next topic um, that needs to be thought about early in development is are there any special FDA programs that could um, be advantageous for the biologic that you're developing? And here's a list of the programs that we're going to talk about in more detail. And is a great one. Um, obviously, it only, it only applies for products that affect less than 200,000 people a year. But if you're in that situation, you definitely want to apply for orphan drug designation because it provides all these benefits. Seven years exclusivity, no user fees, you don't, you're not required to follow the pediatric regulations, and um, as also there's also a, a possibility of applying for an orphan product uh, grant for clinical research. So you can actually get over a million dollars to help with your clinical study by applying for a grant. So um, <clears throat> but the more common things are these expedited programs. Um, they include fast track designation, breakthrough therapy designation, accelerated approval, and prior priority review. And all of these programs are special FDA programs that are provided to help address unmet, med unmet medical need and to um, and for products that are treating a serious or life-threatening condition. So you want to think about these programs early in the development cycle and talk to FDA, and even as early as the pre-IND meeting. It's not too early to talk about some of these topics. But um, it's important to remember that if um, the if something changes with your development pathway or if you don't uh, complete the required studies, that your designations and approvals can be rescinded by FDA. This is very rare, but it can happen. So for fast-track designation, this is definitely one you can apply early in development, um, and it's um, if you meet the criteria. And that uh, gives you access to additional F FDA meetings, which is the end of phase one meeting. It also allows for rolling review of the BLA, and it makes you eligible for um, requesting priority review. Breakthrough therapy designation is a, is a newer one, and this one you have to wait until you have really good clinical data. And basically, if you don't have that wow factor for your clinical data when you go to submit this, it's probably not going to get designated. Um, but if you do and, and you request this designation, it really can speed up your, um, your clinical program because if you have wow data, you typically don't need a huge trial to show significance. So, um, and you get a lot more FDA interaction. It also allows for rolling review of the BLA and it makes you eligible for priority review. The next um, program is accelerated approval. And accelerated approval means that you're granted early BLA approval based on a surrogate endpoint. And um, in that case, a surrogate endpoint should have a reasonable likelihood to predict clinical benefit. You still have to prove efficacy, though, but this is just done as a post-approval study. So an example would be you might gain accelerated approval by showing tumor shrinkage, but then you would get full approval post-approval once you demonstrated a benefit in overall survival. So priority review is um, just means that your application will, will be reviewed in six months plus the two months for submission validation, so eight months overall instead of 10 months, which also has the two-month validation, so 12 months. So it's eight months versus 12 months for normal review. And you apply for priority review at the time of the BLA submission. Another program that um, FDA has for priority review, related to priority review, is that um, if you develop a new drug in, a rare, in an orphan pediatric indication or for a um, or certain tropical diseases, you can actually get a priority review voucher. And, um, and those can be used on a future product um, review clock at, at your own company, or they're actually transferable, so they can be sold on the open market. Okay. Um, the next thing that can happen during the IND is um, companies can actually request to charge for the investigational drugs under the IND, but this is only allowed under very limited circumstances. You would need to provide proof and justification that there's no way for you to develop the drug unless you were able to charge for the drug during tri the trials. And you can only charge for the direct cost of manufacturing the drug. And then the last program is called expanded access. Um, a lot of people refer to this as compassionate use. And this is a situation where you have evidence that your drug probably works, um, but you're busy trying to work on the BLA and things, and there aren't as many trials for patients to be into. So you can um, request expanded access. And that's usually um, done under a treatment IND. So, Marsha, we actually got in another question during your last segment, and the question is, has CBER typically been flexible to allow more than one on-site meeting, um, perhaps as a pre-pre-IND meeting before the pre-IND meeting? 
Yes, they're much more flexible, actually, than cedar typically. But um, and in fact, the cell and gene therapy actually calls it a pre pre ind So yes. Um, but if even if you if you've already had your type B meeting for the pre ind you can still request a type C meeting if you need additional information. Um, and they're very good about granting those. And um, in my experience, in those situations, they it hasn't you haven't had to wait um, you know the whole 75 days. They grant them as soon as they can get everybody ready for the meeting. So they're very flexible. Well, that's great to know. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. So um, the next section is um, what's needed for the BLA. So we're going to jump fast forward now that we've got all this great clinical data. Um, and when we, um, as you're preparing for the BLA, you're going to want to have the pre-BLA meeting with FDA. And you would um, typically wait until you have database locked so you actually have clinical data to um, present to FDA so that you can show them um, and, you know, not in the, you know, full, you know, you're not going to go over every single data point, but you're going to just discuss in, at a high level what data you have and, um, and uh, try to gain their concurrence that that's sufficient for licensure. You also talk about that um, target product profile or draft product label so that um, you're all in agreement on what the claims are and what they're based on, and then uh, to talk in more detail about the final contents of the BLA. And as we discussed previously, there's the five modules of the um, BLA, and the product labeling goes in module one. And then module two is where all of your data to support what you're trying to get into your package label goes. So that's where you tell the story. So the module two is the real, real meat of the BLA. Um, but one, uh, one thing I should point out about module five, when you um, provide all your clinical study reports, you also need to um, provide uh, electronic SAS data output files because FDA also will analyze your data even more potential, they may even do more analyses than, than you did when you prepare the BLA. So you have to provide the clinical output files. Okay, so what happens next? Um, so once you get everything into CBER for your BLA, the uh, Padufa review clock starts once everything's been there. And um, they've actually uh, developed a, a more transparent um, review program called the, the program, and it um, lines out the timeframes and processes um, for their review, and um, it allows for increased sponsor FDA, FDA interaction during the review of the BLA, which is uh, really nice. There's specified times when you, when you know you'll hear from them, and they also will provide the discipline review letters during the review so you can see where things might be getting confused or where th things are off track or where there might be more information that you can provide to, um, to support the BLA. There's three possible Outcomes approvable. Uh, there were too many problems with the BLA, and there's um, they they will not approve it. And then the last one is the complete response, and this is the letter that lists out what their concerns are, and they believe that it might be possible that it, this information is stuff that you could, um, you know, quick maybe not quickly, but get prepared and uh, submit it to them, and, and so. So that keeps the BLA. Hey, is what do I need to do um, after my biologic is approved? So there are a, quite a number of post-approval reporting requirements for biologic. They do reporting with drugs. That's very similar. It is the MedWatch system, and you do have to provide um, quarterly adverse um, drug experience reports for the first three years, and then annually thereafter. The next. Um, is labeling and promotion. So all of your advertising and promotion materials need to be reviewed by um, APLB at CBER prior to dissemination for use. Um, CBER will, will review your materials to make sure that everything you're presenting is uh, fair and balanced. Um, there are a lot of CMC reporting requirements for post approval. So um, the main one and the most important one is the change control. So if you need to make manufacturing changes after approval, you're going, to, um, you're going to need to run a comparability protocol. You may need um, to put in a uh, prior approval supplement and request FDA approval before you can make the, you know, use the material that's made with the change. There's also a um, number of smaller changes that would um, require um, a changes being affected or CVE notifications. The CBER lot release program is a big, um, big program for biologics. For instance, um, all vaccines that are approved on the market need to be you need to send them for testing at CBER before they're released into, um, into clinical use. 
Um, and the last program is the Biologic Product Deviation Report. So if you become aware that um, a product that's already been distributed is compromised in some way, you need to start an investigation and notify FDA within 45 days, and that may lead to a voluntary recall. Um, and the last one um, are the post-approval commitments. So uh, again, this would, these can happen with both drugs and biologics, but during the BLA review, there may be some additional work that FDA wants to see, and you could negotiate that. You could go ahead and be approved, and you'll do the additional work um, in the post-approval uh, time frame. This could be additional clinical studies. Um, it could also be additional CMC work. And the last program is the REMS, which is the Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy. This is a safety program which um, is designed to increase uh, physician and patient education regarding the safe use of a new drug. Um, and this is something that takes um, a fair amount of time to develop, so it's uh, really important to, to talk to FDA early on if they think that a REMS is going to be uh, required for your product. Um, and <clears throat> you would usually know that you might need something like this if there are safety issues or if there's a lot of specific concerns about how the product is administered, that's when um, you may be required to do a REMS. So in summary, we've talked about what is a biologic, what goes into the IND BLA, what is different about biologics drug development, and what, um, what expedited programs your product could be eligible for, and then what to do during and after BLA approval. So if there are no other questions, we'll send it over to Chris for a case study. There's actually one more question, Marcia, and the question is, how can I find out some more information about the Orphan uh, Grant Program? That's the, um, I, we can send a link. It's the Office of Orphan Products Development, OOPD. Um, but why don't we, if they can provide their email, we can send a link. Okay, absolutely. And also, you can always search the FDA website. So any of our listeners who are wondering about any of these specific FDA programs that Marsha mentioned, you can simply go onto the FDA website, go up into the search bar, and enter the terms for breakthrough therapy or orphan product uh, grant program, things like that, and it returns the search quite quickly. So what I'd like to do now is I would like to sort of go through a case study and I am going to be completely open in my disclosure here that this case study is purely hypothetical. It's created solely for the purpose of providing an example of how a company developing a novel biologic therapy might interact with the Center for Biologics Research and Evaluation throughout their product development work. So we're going to start by taking a look at the indication. The indication that our company is developing a therapy for is Duchenne muscular dystrophy, known as DMD. DMD is a progressive disorder that's caused by a mutation in the protein dystrophin. Lack of dystrophin causes muscle cells to be fragile and easily damaged. The gene that encodes dystrophin is on the X chromosome, and therefore the disease occurs a lot more in boys than in girls. Physical impairment can begin to show as early as age three, and it's initially seen in difficulty standing up or maintaining balance. If untreated, typically by the age of 13, these boys cannot stand, and their disease will then continue to progress and will steal their ability to use their arms to breathe, and heart failure can occur. And finally, what I'd like to note for this particular hypothetical case study is that DMD is a rare disease. It occurs in a small population of under 20,000 people in the U.S. Current therapeutic options for DMD are all supportive. None are curative. There are a few drugs that may slow disease progression, and the number of supportive devices and physical therapy programs available for families that are afflicted with this disease has increased. However, the life expectancy for most DMD patients is still significantly shorter than that for the general population, and they require increasing medical intervention as their disease progresses. Our hypothetical company today is going to be called Strong Sons. Strong Sons is hoping to develop a cure for DMD in the form of a genetic therapy. This will be regulated by the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research in the Office of Cellular Tissue and Gene Therapy. 
because this will be a gene therapy product, there will be some additional oversight by the Office of Biotechnology Affairs, or OBA, specifically through the Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee, or the RAC. And this is a group which will review the gene therapy clinical trial protocol and may subject that protocol to public review and discussion. Additionally, for each clinical site in which StrongSons wants to conduct a clinical trial, they will need to submit their protocol to an institutional safety board. This is a board that has a slightly different composition than the standard institutional review board that other drug development protocols are reviewed by. That has uh, people with a little bit different focus, more bioethicists and things of that nature. And finally, because Strong Sons is funded by the NHLBI, all gene therapy clinical trials, regardless of their funding mechanism within NHLBI, must be reviewed by the NHLBI Cell and Gene Therapy Data Safety Monitoring Board. So, Strong Sons is unsure about what information they're going to need to present to FDA in order to proceed with their first clinical trial. They decide to go online and do some research. And since there are no gene therapy products that have been approved thus far in the U.S. by OCTGT, the Office of Cell Tissue and Gene Therapy, um, they can't really refer to the, those approval documents that Marsha identified earlier for a similar therapy. So what they do is they go on to the OCTGT Learn page and they listen to a number of webinars. They also see that there are a number of guidance documents that specifically address the development of gene therapy products. So they download those and they uh, read and understand them. And they think now that they understand the types of data that FDA is going to be looking for in their IND, and they develop a research plan to conduct these studies. To make sure that the pivotal experiments that they're going to be doing will be successful to support their IND filing, and to get initial feedback from FDA on the design of their initial clinical protocol, they request a Type B pre-IND meeting with OCTGT. They submit their meeting information packet one month before the meeting date, and on the day before the meeting, they receive significant written feedback from FDA. On the day of the meeting, they're then able to focus their discussion on only those few questions where FDA did not agree with their proposed plan and they come to understand FDA's safety concerns with their initial clinical, initial clinical protocol as proposed. After their pre-IND meeting, Strong Sons completed the preclinical evaluation of their gene therapy product, including proof of concept and an appropriate animal model of the disease, and they have a reproducible manufacturing process. They've also revised their phase one clinical protocol to address the safety concerns that FDA expressed. They've submitted their protocol to the RAC, and they've received comments back with notification that there's no plan for public review. As they also have NHLBI funding to support their trial, they've submitted their protocol to the NHLBI Cell and Gene Therapy Data Safety Monitoring Board, who reviewed their protocol last month. They're now ready to submit their IND to the FDA and their protocol to the IBC, where they will be performing their first trial. Immediately after filing their IND, Strong Sons registers their clinical protocol on both clinicaltrials.gov and an NIH database, the Genetic Modification Clinical Research Information System, or GEMCRIS, which is a required registration for all gene therapy trials. Alas, there's a glitch. During the 30-day review cycle for their IND, FDA informs them that they're not allowed to proceed with their trial because they haven't provided sufficient CMC information about their product, chemistry and manufacturing controls information. Although the company submits a complete response to clinical hold, the FDA still doesn't allow their trial to proceed. So Strong Sons requests a type A meeting to discuss with their review team what information FDA is looking for in order for the company to begin its clinical trial. At the conclusion of the meeting, both parties have agreed that performing a full set of release testing at one more stability time point will provide sufficient product quality assurance to the FDA for them to allow the trial to proceed. As the phase one trial proceeds, Strong Sons goes ahead and submits a request for orphan designation to the Office of Orphan Product Development. This enables them to apply for a number of um, programs and credits that Marcia described earlier. 
and allows they are then eligible to apply for FDA's Orphan Product Grants Program, which can provide some uh, money to support a portion of their clinical trials. What the orphan designation does not do is it doesn't change the regulatory requirements of safety and efficacy that will be required in order for Strong Sons to obtain marketing approval for their gene therapy product. At the conclusion of their phase one trial, the companies demonstrated a level of clinical benefit. They realized that they may be eligible for breakthrough designation because they are showing a substantial improvement over existing therapies in one or more clinically significant endpoints in this population. In addition to providing a boost to the company's valuation, breakthrough designation allows the company much more access to senior FDA reviewers who can provide feedback on the, their development program and allows them to submit sections of their BLA as they are complete, also known as a rolling submission. As Strong Sons is developing a therapy which will be used to treat a rare disease in a primarily pediatric population. They submit a request for a rare pediatric disease priority review voucher. This voucher is transferable, assuming that they are actually approved for marketing, and allows the redeemer to get a priority review for an NDA or BLA for a therapy in any indication and for any population. Strong, so, strong Sons that knows that these vouchers are nearly as lucrative as bitcoins. The, <laughs> uh, the first two that have been sold, the first was sold by Biomarin in July of this year for $67.5 million, and Knight Therapeutics just last month sold theirs for $125 million. This is quite a boost to a small company working in an orphan space. Because their um, technology, their gene therapy, is showing such wonderful uh, results, when they file their BLA, FDA already decided that they would uh, review it using their priority review shorter time frame, using the two-month acceptance review and the maximum of six months for data review. So within eight months, Strong Sons receives an approvable letter from FDA and DMD patients are able to access this important new therapy. But the story doesn't end here. There are post-marketing commitments that come along with this uh, new therapy. So after their therapy is on market, because it is a gene therapy product, for the, they are required to follow their uh, clinical trial subjects for up to 15 years for follow-up screening for safety. And because they applied for and received the rare disease priority review voucher, they are required, they have agreed in that process to provide some additional safety reporting to FDA covering each of the first four post-approval years. This information allows FDA to understand more fully the actual size of the patient population in that disease, as well as the amount of product that would be needed to meet the needs of that population. That concludes the case study for today. And what I'd like to do now is ask if we have some additional questions. And I see that we do. So I am going to read the questions aloud, and Marsha, perhaps you and I together can manage to answer these. The first question is, you mentioned items covered by CDER and CBER at the beginning of the presentation. Where do peptides fall? Peptides fall under CDER. Okay, because so depending upon the uh, specific uh, therapeutic, then that would be reviewed by the different divisions within CDER that um, that normally review new drugs. That's correct, and that's because they're easily uh, characterized and synthesized, so they're considered well characterized. Excellent. And the next question is, what is included in a treatment IND? How is that different than a normal IND? It um. 
the probably the best way to do this one is under the sponsors IND and so the sponsor can cross reference the rest of the information in the IND and then the um, the treatment I is basically just a treatment protocol at that point so it's a special protocol for um, a specific patient population that um, you believe will benefit from the therapy and don't have any other options so it's a, a compassionate use protocol if, if you do it as a separate treatment IND that is fine um, but you still need to provide um, you know, um, either a link or some access to the preclinical information and chemistry manufacturing and control information as well, so that the FDA can evaluate the safety of the protocol you want to run. Wonderful. And then the final question that I have at the moment, I'm going to read it exactly. I may have missed this, but regarding the Institutional Safety Board, or IBC, was that specific to gene therapy products, or does that also apply to tissue products? Would the IRB at a site typically inform the sponsor if an IBC is required? Um, it's also required for um, cell therapies. Um, so it's, um, so yes, the, the, institute, the IRB will determine when the IBC is needed. Um, but you can, um, you can count on it with gene therapy and a lot of cell therapies. Well, um, <clears throat> because a lot of times the cells have been modified um, and so the, that's why they want the IBC to review them. Okay. Well, great. That covers all of the questions that we have right now. So I am going to um, say thank you very much, Marsha, for your time today, and thank you to our audience. I think this has been a, a very good presentation. I appreciate the very interactive nature of all of the questions. I'd like to tell you a little bit about a future Hangout that will be coming up. My future Hangout will the next one scheduled will be coming up on March 17th at 2 o'clock Eastern Time, and it will be focused on choosing a regulatory consultant. It will be, as this one has been, broadcast on both Google Plus and YouTube. Additional topics that are under consideration for 2015 include an overview of drug development and regulation, current conversations in diagnostic development, creating and using a device development plan, and FDA non-traditional approval programs, going a little bit more in depth on that. But I would love to hear from you, my audience, about what is of interest to you. So please feel free to suggest additional topics. In addition to my future topics, within my office, the NHLBI Small Biz Hangouts are expanding. So as of next February, we will be running a business development series, and the first of those will be on the 10th of February at 2 o'clock Eastern Time, and it will be an introduction to the Phase 2 SBIR commercialization plan that will be coordinated by my colleague, Dr. Gary Robinson. And in April, we haven't figured out the exact date yet, but I'm pretty sure it'll be a Tuesday at 2 o'clock Eastern Time, we will have a intellectual property specialist, Dr. Gautam Prakash, talking about intellectual property basics for the new innovator. To find out more about these programs and to receive updates about the NHLBI Small Biz Hangouts, please follow us on Twitter and or sign up for our listserv. We regularly update this type of information as the events draw near. And finally, I'd like to say thank you one more time. These Hangouts are organized and presented by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, Office of Translational Alliances and Coordination. If you're developing a product or technology within the NHLBI mission space, which covers cardiovascular, pulmonary, hematologic, or sleep disorders and diseases, please contact us through our website for additional assistance. If you're developing a product or technology outside of NHLBI's mission space, please use the resources presented in this Hangout to reach out to the appropriate office at FDA or institute at the NIH for additional assistance. And with that, I would like to say thank you one more time to Marsha, and I'd like to ask our audience if there are any final questions. I don't see any additional questions currently posted, and so thank you so much for your attention today, and thank you, Marsha.